You don't. Welcome, friends. Uh, we are recording today on January 18th, 2021, as we commemorate the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We will continue our conversations on COVID-19 vaccination with the Reverend Jacques-André de Graff, an important leader, speaker, and convener. He is the associate pastor of the Canaan Baptist Church of Christ in New York City, the chair of the Friends of Harlem Hospital, a founding member of Harlem Week in New York City, the co-chair of the Attorney General for the State of New York's Black Jewish Clergy Roundtable, and Reverend DeGraff, if I were to read off all of your roles and honoraria, we would not have time for our interviews. So I will refer people uh, to your website for, for more background. Uh, but I am really greatly appreciative of your taking time out of your schedule to have this conversation about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccination. You are uh, a leader uh, in this issue. And one of the uh, big initiatives that you have recently launched is Choose Healthy Life. So I'm gonna ask you first to tell us about uh, some of your, your thoughts on the issue, your background and your community, and uh, then a little bit about Choose Healthy Life. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and, and your interest in your outreach uh, speak to who R Rabbi Julie is, uh, a person who has always gone above and beyond. And so I'm delighted to be in, in the house. Uh, we are in the midst of a national moment of decision, really. Uh, choose healthy life, of course, comes from Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, choose healthy life so that thou and thy seed might live. And it speaks to the empowerment we have when we make right decisions. Uh, America is right now at a crossroads. With, on Martin Luther King Day, it's a day of service and remembrance in many parts of our country. And in New York, those of us who are particularly concerned about the pandemic have gathered together and, and joined a national health initiative and, and used the Black church as a platform to, to bring the message, get the word out, and to motivate and advocate on behalf of our community. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, we mean that the Black church has been a champion on behalf of our community in so many ways. Uh, you can go back to the struggle for civil rights, uh, which evolved to the struggle for human rights, uh, the, the fights against drug addiction and crack epidemic, teen pregnancy, HIV, AIDS, and now the latest, the, the latest battle against COVID. But it occurs at a time when there's racial justice, unrest and issues uh, dominating the headlines, economic uncertainty, uh, food deprivation, uh, and you mix all of that together with what's been happening in the nation's capital. And at a time uh, when Americans should be together most, we find ourselves at the barricades. And so the church has to take its rightful place to one, uh, preach our gospel, uh, to, to live our gospel. And in doing that, we have joined a national initiative called Choose Healthy Life. Choose Healthy Life is a partnership between Quest Diagnostics, the United Way. Uh, it's governed by Choose Healthy Life, the organization. It's in five cities as the rollout, Detroit, Atlanta, Newark, DC, and New York. Each of those cities has a clergy uh, chair. Our national co-chairs are Reverend Dr. Calvin Butts and Reverend Al Sharpton. Each of the cities has a chair in Atlanta our chair just got elected to the United States Senate, Raphael Warner, and we're delighted. And it is my privilege to serve as the chair in New York City. Each city will have 10 churches, uh, and the 10 churches will, will, will have a program and with a full-time professional health navigator to lead us in testing, uh, tracing, uh, empowering our communities. So we had, for instance, last week, our pilot run at Canaan Baptist Church. And a woman came in, and an elderly woman came in, and she was a little hesitant. And part of the protocol is that you have to have an email address so that when you get the results, it can be sent in a secured fashion. 
and we were able to get her an email address on the spot. It was empowering. It was informative and empowering, and it was transformative. And that's part of the role of the church in our community. Well, uh, the, the issues about the vaccine are front and center right now. Some people point to the Tuskegee experiment where men were intentionally injected with syphilis and then monitored over the years. But our, our situation, our predicament in America today speaks to health disparities. Health disparities are why we have different death rates, uh, twice the death rates of whites in the COVID crisis, but we have health disparities around diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiac issues. Uh, and so these are the underlying conditions which set up our uh, vulnerability to this particular crisis. And so the church has come together to stand in the gap between government public policies in the private sector and our communities and advocate on that behalf. And so we, uh, in that process, we had to learn. We had to learn and grow on the issues of social justice versus the nexus of public health and, and public health empowerment. And it's been an exciting venture. And today, Martin Luther King Day, we had a national summit. And the national summit had leading figures like Dr. Fauci, Sean Penn, uh, Secretary uh, Lewis Sullivan, all came together to discuss this and inform our community. So Reverend DeGraff, uh, take me back a little bit uh, because this is such an incredibly important development, uh, not only for the lives it will save and the health that will be spared uh, from the ravages of COVID-19, but it will also, I, I believe and I hope, have an impact on health and public health in the United States for a long time to come. We know that every journey is a long journey, right? It's not just what we're going to do this week or this month. But I want you to, if you would, take us back on a couple of issues. I, I believe, if I'm correct, that you are the social justice pastor at Canaan Baptist Christ Church. And, um, and if, I, if I'm correct, I believe that you were inspired to that role specifically and directly by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And could you tell us a little bit about, about that experience? You talked about the learning that you did this morning, but that learning goes back decades. And so can you tell us a little bit about that? Very kind, yes. When I was a teenager, which was decades ago, uh, I, I was chosen for a program for gifted youth at Morehouse and at Spelman in Atlanta. Now, being a New Yorker, uh, my view of the South was fire hoses and dogs and police and billy clubs. So going down to spend the summer in the South was uh, an act of faith in and of itself. Uh, we were the only Northerners, my best friend and I, Charles Johnson at that time, we went down and uh, it was exciting to be in the capital of Black America at Atlanta at that time. And um, one of my instructors in English and English languages invited me uh, to attend her service, her church service that Sunday. Uh, Charles and I went and we found ourselves in the front row because we were guests of this instructor. She did not tell me that her father was the pastor and the preacher that day was her brother, Martin Luther King. And, and so uh, the arc of my life changed in that moment. And I went in on an Episcopal, uh, Episcopal, and, and we jokingly in the uh, community say that uh, Episcopals have a rather restrained uh, worship tradition. And uh, with the music and the preaching, the powerful preaching, uh, I came in a, a, an Episcopalian, but the Baptist seed had been planted and the power of his presence and his message was transformative for me. And when I actually was introduced to him and got to meet him, I knew at 14 years of age that this was a moment that would change my life. And I could also see in him and feel, it was not just a, an intellectual observation, it was a spiritual moment that this was God's spokesman, this was God's messenger. And, and as we, shook hands and made eye contact and had this moment together. I could feel transformation. The years later, when I was in college, I went to a church in Harlem, uh, Canaan Baptist Church, and the pastor there, the Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, had been Martin Luther King's chief of staff, but I didn't know that. 
uh, and Martin Luther King in 1968, it came to Harlem and installed Dr. King as the pastor of this church. And he was assassinated 10 days later. And so um, knowing that history and, and working with Dr. Walker, uh, my tradition of activism just blossomed and grew. And so we were involved in the struggles in the Sudan to fight uh, injustice to Christians under that time. Uh, I served as um, a chief of protocol to Reverend Sharpton when we went to Cuba to deal with the impact of the US embargo on communities there, uh, voter registration and voter access and a variety of other issues. But, but when it came to health, my mother had been a nurse. And so uh, when this particular crisis came, I was familiar with some of the many causes, Rabbi, that, that affect our community and people don't always connect the dots. People talk about Tuskegee, but right now today, black women have a higher mater maternal mortality rate than any other group in the country. Uh, and so uh, there are many uh, implicit bias issues in healthcare that prevent our folk from moving uh, expeditiously when we have a situation as we do now. It's like we don't, uh, the hospitals and doctors don't treat us the way they treat other people. Uh, that is changing because of our advocacy, but uh, women have complained that they've been in, in, in labor or with other female issues, and they can't get the painkillers that others get because of a bias in that particular direction. And so our relationship to the healthcare industry, the healthcare system is different than other communities. And so when this crisis hit, that history was prevalent in our thinking about how we would respond. And so we needed people to tell us what was the science of this moment and how could we be, be bridge builders to get our folk the help and get ourselves the service that would be instrumental. And so that example that I gave about the email, uh, we wanted to, to, to culturally be competent in messaging our own folk and empowering to our people. And so we have learned today, we had a summit and we spoke with Dr. Fauci. We spoke with Sean Penn. We spoke with former uh, health secretary, Louis Sullivan and clergy from across the country gathered to learn, to be educated so that we can message and advocate on behalf of our people. That is uh, so inspiring and so important. Uh, and as a, as a fellow member of the clergy, you know, understanding that our churches, synagogues, mosques, temples have tremendous potential, uh, often unrealized potential to have an impact on the lives of the people who are members of our congregations and also far beyond that. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm one of the things as a, a lifelong uh, New Yorker, I live outside of New York City right now, but I, I grew up in New York City the Harlem community, the churches have been so effective and such national leaders as your church has been in, um, in really working with ser service agencies, social service agencies, local hospitals, et cetera, to really sort of expand that network of community and what community means. And I'm wondering to, uh, to our fellow members of the clergy around the country who are watching this video, what is some of the best practices and advice that you would give people? Well, I, I, I really appreciate that question because one of the unspoken uh, dimensions of this problem is the impact, the current impact of a the dilemma, a health crisis that has taken the lives of it right about now. 400,000 Americans. And yet we haven't been able to, to have a funeral. We haven't had, been able to have the repast. We haven't been able to have the rituals of bereavement that help us get through these moments. And so it extends the grief because we haven't had that release. We haven't had, and, and, and I have done a funeral in a cemetery and they stood at the gate and counted that you can't have more than 10 people. And so when we came with 12, two people had to sit in the car. Uh, their, their heartache is palpable. And multiply that by situations because everybody, number one, doesn't die in a hospital. Uh, everyone didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Imagine a, a beloved grandmother and you have to say goodbye on FaceTime. That person needs counseling. That, that person needs comfort. 
and the church has played that role. And so one of the issues and one of the dimensions of this is that we as clergy have to look beyond what is presented to us and be comforters in this hour. Uh, we have to be uh, liaisons, coordinators to provide services, but we have to be fundamentally comforters in an age when people are cynical about a lot of their institutions. Uh, the country is experiencing uh, a divisive trauma, if, even as we speak, and we're hoping that this week will be will, will help transform us not to what we used to be, but to what we could be through this inauguration. And so, those of us uh, who mount pulpits and speak to God's people, uh, we need to be mindful of of their pain. There's there's someone in our congregation who every month when the first comes around they're living in terror that they may be a victim. Uh, there, there is someone in our community who, who is lonely and, and they can't, they, they may give outward appearances, but they're isolated and in their home. And there's a, an epidemic of mental health issues that are now beginning to manifest. We see it in gun violence, but there's increasing domestic violence, alcoholism, and all of these things are tearing at the fabric of our faith. And so we have to double down uh, as clergy. And one of the ways we have to do that is do what we're doing right now. And that is talk to one another because clergy are hurting. Uh, the fact of the matter is who go, who, who comforts the caregivers, who comforts the healers. And, and so many clergy, and, 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 and as by way of observation, we're not really good at self-care. Too many of us put everyone else first and suffer silently. And so one of the issues that you've really suggested is how we need to be mindful of how we take care of ourselves uh, so that we can serve others. Uh, this is a very, very challenging time in America, but even in this anguish of this moment, we have a chance to lift our eyes to the hills from whence cometh our help and, and bring America back to where it could be. Uh, not to where it once was, to where we could be when we hold hands and march together. Reverend, what have been some of the, in that, in that vein, what have been some of the moments of inspiration that have kept you going during this time? What have you learned, heard? One of, one of the things that I, that I learned, and that's a, that is really a question. Um, Dr. Fauci in, in, in his uh, presentation, uh, without being asked, volunteered that a, a woman, a Dr. Corbett, uh, her work is instrumental in the development of the vaccine. This vaccine is a scientific uh, wonder. It, it developed a vaccine in 10 months uh, and, and for uh, under these circumstances, it's historic. It's, it, it, it's, it's, one could make an argument that it's miracle level uh, accomplishment. And in that accomplishment is a black woman in Kizometa Corbett. And for me, there was a, a, a series back in the day called Roots. And in Roots, one of the, one of the creep characters is a woman named Kizzy. And so we've gone from Kizzy in slavery to Kizzy in salvation as, as Dr. Corbett's contribution to the vaccine is, 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 is instrumental. And that's important because black folk need to know that there's some folk who are in the room who look like us, who are part of this. Uh, that's, that's the fundamental uh, takeaway. And uh, there are now many in the, in the scientific and medical community who have come forward and saying it's gonna be all right, uh, that blacks were in the, in the pool, the testing pool, in the, in, the, uh, in the development of this vaccine. And then they are doing something else. They've been explaining the science to us. One of the historic fears, and you know, there's a whole anti-vaccination school of thought, and uh, that they they inject us with this that we will either be guinea pigs or victims. Uh, but this is not this this approach doesn't inject folk with the with the virus. It instead uh, strengthens and prepares our own immune system to fight the virus. That's a fundamental difference. And it's a fundamentally different approach. And to be able to, uh, uh, six months ago, I couldn't have given you that response. 
but we had to spend some time learning about it so that we could be authentic messengers, authentic partners in coming to our community and saying, it's going to be all right. Uh, and, and people, more than anything else, Rabbi, they want hope. We want hope. We want to believe that we can do this again. And so for me, uh, the inspirational moment was to be able to look Dr. Fauci in the eye, ask him a question and get an answer that, that, that said to me, uh, reduce your fears, hope is here, help is on the way. Please God, let it be so. Reverend, I want to uh, I, I want to continue a little bit in 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 that vein. You know, one of the groups of people who are struggling so much are healthcare workers, and uh, we know uh, especially that so many members of the Black community are involved in healthcare delivery very personally, and many many other Americans who are putting their lives and their health on the line every day to care for all of us, to keep us alive. And, uh, and I wanna sort of ask a, a couple of questions, you know, pick any dimension that you think is the most important. Uh, one is what spiritual counsel, you know, do you offer to healthcare workers? You mentioned clergy and, you know, our own need for self-care in terms of their self-care. And uh, well, I think I'm going to leave. I think I'd, I'd like to hear that you talk about that a little bit. Well, one of the one of the things in my Harlem Hospital hat is that the chair of the Friends of Harlem Hospital. We are a fundraising auxiliary, and most of the most of the fundraising heretofore had been for equipment, uh, for to to complement or supplement what the hospital and the government provides. We we go above and beyond, but through this crisis and having again been the child of an, a, a nurse. Uh, I know what it's like when people do a double shift and somebody at home doesn't, doesn't have their mother at dinner on Christmas. Uh, someone at home uh, misses or sees the impact of a double shift or, or a particularly uh, compelling situation. And so we, we at Harlem Hospital, we supported the creation of an OASIS center within the hospital where a hospital staff would go just to get a break, uh, just to hear a babbling brook, breed some eucalyptus, hear uh, dental and soothing music in a, in a closed room of, of quiet and serenity. Um, that, it, and, and we funded that, but, but Julie, we meet in, in, in boardrooms and through Zoom, uh, but I had the occasion last uh, two weeks ago that I got word that a member of the church had pneumonia. So uh, even though they told folk, don't go to the hospital that I had to step out on faith. And so I went to the hospital and found out that he actually had COVID and uh, went with my mask on and, and went through a, a, a situation that was so gripping uh, that I've been in hospital over the years many, many times. But this time, the, my mask was inadequate, so I had to go down and register for a mask. The mask came in an individually wrapped uh, package. Then I had to go back to the floor put on that mask, put on a hairnet, gloves, the whole PPP. They took my coat and jacket and put it in a bag. Uh, and all the while, there was a, a energy and a tension and a, um, between uh, that was observable and was palpable with the healthcare workers. The woman, the nurse who helped me was, had, was on her second shift. I went into the room with uh, our member, and, and as soon as I saw him, I realized it would probably be the last time I see him. And, uh, and so I was in there offering a prayer uh, and, and my humanity holding his hand. And, um, and then I left um, with a racing heart, uh, got my belongings back. And, but I was there for 20 minutes to half an hour. And I realized that our healthcare professionals are there, you know, for, for many, many hours, many, many days. And as I came out, the, the thought that I had about these healthcare workers, they are risking everything so that we might be well. And it is unfair, it's inhumane for people to argue about wearing a mask, for people to demand to be able to sit in places that would be 
uh, unhealthy. It's it, it's unfair. It's unhealthy. Um, and 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 it made me redouble our efforts to practice and preach on social distancing, to say the consequences to someone who 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 risk everything. It's not fair to them to 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 have them at risk of infecting their families and themselves, and we not do our part. The, the, the whole notion that we're in this together has to be has to be coming from the pulpits to say it doesn't matter what public policy or the law, it's the right thing for us to be doing if we are all in this together. And we cannot let folk sacrifice and let their sacrifices be rendered meaningless because we don't want to wear a mask. It's not too much. We wear a seat belt, or bu buckle our seat belts when we get in a car. Motorcyclists put on a helmet. We're asking everyone, everyone, put on that mask. Uh, protect yourself, protect your brothers and sisters. It may be uncomfortable or inconvenient, but I can tell you from personal experience, it's not as inconvenient as ICU and an intubation tube. Reverend DeGraff, that is, that is the message, the first message that we all need to hear, to remember that you know we share health, right? That is the message of public health. Health is something we share. So uh, I want to ask you, you've, you've been very generous with your time and I'd like to just uh, do two things before we, we finish. One is to ask, is there anything in terms of the Choose Healthy Life initiative and in terms of advocacy and work that we can all be doing together, the people who are uh, listening and learning today, anything that I didn't ask you that you want to make sure we know about? Well, uh, I want the faith community to know that uh, this is fundamental, that prayer works, uh, that, that it, it's not in a book, it, that each of us has to redouble our relationship and pray. And, and, and fellowship and stay connected with one another. The, 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 everyone who needs help doesn't ask for it or know how to ask for it, but somebody just needs you to call and say, I was thinking about you. Somebody needs you to say, uh, I'd like to do shopping for you because I know the circumstance, whatever. Uh, we, we need to care and go the extra mile for each other and pray. Thank you, Reverend DeGraff. Uh, you know, it's been a tremendous uh, opportunity and privilege to spend this time with you today. Of course, uh, for me, the fact that we are doing this together on the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. makes it even more uh, powerful and important. And uh, I believe that you have given honor to Dr. King's memory today uh, in the most profound ways. And, uh, and honor to all of those who have suffered and sacrificed and do suffer and sacrifice to bring about an end to this pandemic. And so I ask you to offer a, a final closing word to us to end our time together. My mentor, uh, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, uh, was a world-class music, had mu world-class musical ability. He was also a photographer of extraordinary talent was exhibited in many places. Uh, too often people will, will try to put clergy in a box and only let you talk about X or Y. Um, but in this season, I, I remember uh, one of the messages that Dr. Walker, the late Dr. Walker, talked about, about entering into a, a struggle, a fight, or a situation when you don't know what the outcome is gonna be and giving it your best anyhow. He talked about, uh, Anyhow faith, uh, that's an hour that we're in right now. Anyhow faith, uh, history will show that throughout the course of, of human events, right still wins, uh, that a candle still defeats the, the, the darkness. And so we have to step out together, together on faith. And each of us needs, each of your viewers and listeners needs to reflect and then commit to moving forward, even when we don't know when the end will come, how the end will come. But we have to be convinced and remain convicted that the best is yet to come. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Kenya Hiratson, yes, may it be so. I'm going to end our recording now.